welcome to the latest edition of This Racing Life. With the launch of National Racehorse Week behind us, we have come down to see trainer Richard Phillips, one of the pioneers behind that great innovation, to talk to him a little bit more about it. Ashley Witcher will also be dropping in upon us, last year's Magnolia Cup winner, to talk to us about her unconventional route into the industry and to find out a little bit more about how the Younger Brigade might be best attracted into the racing world. First up, though, we dropped into Newmarket to talk to David Simcock about the five-time Group 1 winner, Dream Ahead. From very early days, um, I think I said, you know, during his career, I'll, I'll never have a horse as good as this. Um, and, I, and I don't think I ever will. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, most extraordinary two-year-old, never had one like him. He was fast, he was good, and he showed it at home, and, um, you know, winning winning the th uh, two Group 1s as a as a two-year-old and winning the middle part in the morning and the second start and I tried to be greedy and tried to be the first horse to win all three while running him in the Dewhurst. Mm. And, um, but no, he was good and listen, at the end of the day, he was, you can't take it away from his champion two-year-old with Frankel. I was going um, to say, in hindsight, you can't really believe your bad luck to bump into Frankel of all the I'm years not, to have I, a brilliant two-year-old. Yeah, um, no, it, was, it, was, it was quite extraordinary. And then to go on at three, it was totally different. He sort of, you know, at home, he didn't show anywhere near as much as at home as he did um, as a two-year-old but you know he still he still won his three group ones that year um, culminating in beating Goldie Cover at Longchamp when everything went quiet for about five minutes afterwards but um, no it was it, he was a very very special horse and like I said he was you know I don't think I'll ever see one like him. It was about 13, 14 years ago now since then the training horizon has changed a fair bit in your opinion what's changed the most? I think we are slightly in danger of having the mega yard um, and they are tend to all a lot of the best horses tend to be in those yards and hence it's you could argue that the group twos and group threes have suffered slightly for that um, but those guys have earned their right and they're brilliant trainers and, and they're big and they're powerful. Um, they're training hundreds of hundreds of horses but they're training them very very well. Mm. Um, that's definitely changed. Um, I think, you know, the young crop that are coming through, trainers, are exceptionally good. Mm -hmm. um, Given those behemoths at the top then, with, with the big yards you just mentioned, do you think it is becoming harder for the young guys to break through? Um, I think they've had to look at it in a different way. Um, you know, I mentioned a few names and there's a lot of them, but the Archie Watsons, the George Bowies, the Kim Fel Kevin Philippot Foys, um, and there's many, many more. There's some really, really good young talented trainers and they're aggressive mm -hmm. and their horses run and they're fit and they're good and they analyse their horses very quickly. Um, and right, if we need to be off a certain mark, we'll be off a certain mark. It means we're going to win three or if we're good, we'll go straight there. Um, and that's their way of competing. Um, my era it was when I started. It was it was competitive. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I started about the same time as Rafe, and you know Rafe's gone to the very top now, and he's he's really you know taken off and proved himself how good he really is. Um, but yeah, I, I, th I think you know the fact there are good young generation coming through. Um, they're successful and actually they're really nice guys as well. Mm. Coming back to the yard here, what I noticed most about it I think was its tranquility and, and quiet surroundings. And I did speak to a couple of your staff and they said exactly the same thing. Does that, does that help the way the horses run you think, to, be, to be relaxed? I'm sure it helps. I mean, we're, we're not a, we are relatively quiet here. Um, it's not a shouty yard. Um, my head man would be the, is quiet and when he speaks you listen and I, and I like that I'm not a shaggy person I used to be um, but I'm far far sort of more mellowed, set of mellowed. yeah <laughs> now definitely 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 I used to hollow shout and swear at everybody and um, and uh, now not so much but I think I'm probably enjoying it more um, but um, listen we're, we're we, we we look at the horses and try and see what we've got and you know I'm still very fortunate to be training some very good horses and I can't not mention one of the main stalwarts of your yard over the many years, Jamie Spencer. He's been, a, he's been quite the asset to you over the last kind of decade or so, hasn't he? Yeah, he's been extremely loyal. Um, we knew each other from Lucas back in the day and um, no, he's a massive asset. Um, sometimes I think 
people get it wrong, how they judge him. Um, but uh, no, I'm always very happy to have him on board and have him around. With his partnership with Bless Him last year, I know that some say that you know he's, he's, he's as good from the front as he's from the back, but it seems as though him and Bless Him have got that very special way of working together. Listen, he fits, he knows the horse very, very well. He fits, you know, he, he rides every horse well, light infantry cash. Um, and no, he's very professional, he's very fit. He'd be in every day if he could, um, and he's hungry. Yeah. And that's important. I think there's a, that misconception that, you know, he holds everything up. Well, he doesn't hold everything up at all. He's very, very good from the front and, you know, he sits where he's happiest or where he thinks he's going to do the best job. And um, I think half the time when he rides for other trainers, because he's known as a hold up jockey, he's asked to hold them up. Mm. You know, um, the other thing is, I think everything he does is for the horse and for the future. You know, it might not be great for the punters that particular time, but you know, sometimes we have to look and there is another day and we're protecting horses, protecting owners. Um, and you know, that's just the way it is. And sometimes he gets it in the neck more than others. And I think if you ask plenty of judges over the years, you know, who would they nominate as their, as their main horseman or the most talented horseman around, it would be Spencer. He's, he's certainly one of them, definitely, yeah. definitely, definitely. And like I said, he's a proper horseman and he cares for the horse. He really, really does. So. You know, he's not going to give a horse a hard race if he doesn't think he can win. It's, it's just, you know, heartbreaking to see that sometimes. Yeah. Next up, we caught up with Richard Phillips at Adelstrop Stables about his unconventional route into racing. I was very lucky. Um, I was born in a little village called Ashton next to Epsom in Surrey. And therefore, uh, my father used to walk his five sons up to the Epsom Downs because it was free. Mm. And uh, we'd, the nearest point of Epsom Downs to us was the start, the Derby start. So I used to go to the Derby start, see Lester Piggott and Jeff Lewis and all the great Joe Mercers and great jockeys. Um, and I was in love with the sport from the age of six or seven. And I told my father when I was um, pretty young that well, I didn't want to be a jockey, I want to be a trainer. And I come from a long line of school teachers, really. So it's probably in my sort of makeup, the fact mm. that I'm that sort of person that I like, if you like, guiding and controlling and, um, and training, as it were. So. I always knew what I wanted to do, so I was very lucky and, and um, I rode horses. I worked in a little yard, stables, uh, after school every day. You couldn't keep me away from horses, um, apart from O levels and A levels. I was with them every day. And then, um, but I always wanted to train racehorses and I thought, how do you become a racehorse trainer um, if your father's a civil servant in Whitehall, like my father was, <laughs> who should have been a sheep farmer or a vet, really. He was from the Welsh. Um, the Brecon area really is family and um, but I always knew that I wanted to do it but how do you do it so um, I saw in the sporting life an advertisement for Whitney College stud and stable husbandry course and you'd be amazed at how many people went on that course uh, and I had to get a year's experience before I went there so I did as a the MP famously said get on your bike and look for work mm. called Norman Tebbett a minister who I've since met at Plumpton races he was, he was a great character, great man, and, and he, I was so keen, I actually didn't have a bike. I, I literally ran from Abingdon, where my brother lived, to, um, to Lambourne and knocked on doors for jobs. And I knocked on Fred Winter's door, wanting a year's work experience. Uh, his delightful daughter, Philippa, who's unfortunately not with us anymore, answered the door. And um, she said, well, actually, my father's busy, but the assistant trainer will be back after second lot so if you want to come back then and you can speak to him so I thought well, I won't wait for that I'll pop next door I don't know who that was and it was Fort Warwin's yard <laughs> it was my you know Fred Winter Fort were my heroes and you're plucking some big names out here yeah and Kath Wilwin who's sadly uh, died quite recently who's a l wonderful person answered the door and I said look I'm looking for a job in racing and don't care what I do or I don't want paying I just want to get some experience because I want to go to Whitney College I said, well, I'll go and get Mr. Warwin. So Fort Warwin came to the door and couldn't be more charming and said, uh, we don't have any, you've got enough staff at the moment, but the best of luck of your career and, you know, keep going and I'm sure it'll, I'm sure you'll find something. So um, I then went back to find the assistant at Fred Winters, a man called Oliver Sherwood. Oh. And who could not have been more charming and more helpful. And he said, well, we'll see if all the staff come back off um, their summer holidays and we'll, um, We'll let you know. So anyway, I got a postcard a few weeks later from Oliver Sherwood saying, 
all the staff have come back, but best of luck with your career and hope things work out, etc. So I remember 30 years later, I think I sent him a card saying, it's 30 years since you sent me a postcard, now I'm sending you one after, one, after winning the Grand National. So um, <laughs> uh, I congratulate on him on many clouds winning. So Oliver's a great man, as we know. And, um, but I'm very lucky because I always knew what I wanted to do. But the first impression was that racing was very friendly, very supportive and very helpful. And I've always had that. And I want to get that message across. I've always had that. Mm. And I'd like to think that I have been uh, in, in the things I've done uh, when young people want to come into racing, because I know what it feels like. But I think it's a very open sport like that. And they don't care creed or color, name don't matter. If you love racing and love horses, there's a place for you. When you started training, did you enjoy it as much as you thought you would? I didn't think too much about it because I knew it was going to be a long, hard road. Mm. Um, Michael Caulfield is a great friend of mine. Um, who was Secretary of the Jockey Association for a while now, a sports psychologist. And he remembers me saying, as we're moving all the sort of stuff from one stable to another, I said, it's going to be tough, Mick. And he always remembers me saying this, um, but I was always prepared for that. Mm. And um, it is a tough life, but if you enjoy it, you're prepared to put up with it. And I know that you had some fairly prominent names now riding for you in their younger days. Yeah, absolutely. So again, when you're mentoring, I think, I gave, my, gave the first ride to Adam Wedge at Wolverhampton on the flat and the first ride to Charlie Hills on its first ride in the flat. So, um, How do they get on? They've improved since. <laughs> what I love about your philosophy, your philosophy, if yeah, I've got yeah. the right Philip, term there. Being philosophical, I call it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. there you go. Um, is your desire to nurture and fulfil young talent mm. and also young passion in the game as well because that's a big part of your... You're, you're, you're thinking about the whole game, really, isn't it? Yeah, I've always um, been a bit like that. I've always sort of not make a difference, as it were. But I've been very lucky. I've had mentors all my life. I still play golf with my school teachers 45 years later. So I still know them. And they look younger than me, which is really depressing. Uh, but my PE teachers, etc. So I've had a very lucky existence. In the fact, I've always been surrounded by good people. And because of that, I want to pass that on a bit. You know, I've been lucky, especially with the staffing problems in society, not just racing. But I want people to see that racing is not to be feared. Uh, racing is a great world, a great sport, whether it's in the racing yard or in the stud world. There's so many advantages to it and there's so much passion involved in it. You're surrounded by so many good people and they care about horses. And you're very modest, but really you were the innovator behind National Racehorse Week, which has become <laughs> quite a big thing over the last couple of years. It is helpful, isn't it, in, in attracting new people and giving access to people who might not otherwise be interested in racing? Absolutely. And I think I came up with National Racehorse Day and it's turned into a week because you can't tell the story in a day. You know, mm. uh, there's too many things to say. There's so many good things going on. So I came up with National Racehorse Day because I think we needed to do something um, to show everyone. And uh, because we should be transparent, we should show the public what we do because once they witness it, they'll be very happy about it, I think. I remember. In our first year of National Racehorse Week, racing to school came, and a local school, school came along, and a, and a load of 10-year-old children who were sort of fearful of horses along the line here. There's full of, they're all on their holidays at the moment, the horses, but it was full of horses along there. And I could see they're a little bit lacking in confidence with the horse and wondering what they're going to do. I said, they're not going to bite you. All they want to do is find out if you like them. And I just put my head down, and this horse on the end, it was sort of playing with my hair, and mm. I looked up, there's nine children along there, all put their heads down <laughs> like that, and all the horses were sort of, um, sort of licking their heads. And I thought to myself, they won't forget that experience. Their experience then will be that racehorses have a good life, as it were. So, you know, I think that's what I want, the message I want to get across. Yeah. And that's the kind of age you really want to get them involved, because they, as you say, they don't forget it. You don't forget it. At that age, it's amazing what you remember. And I think if you have a good experience at that age, um, and I think you'll know as soon as you walk in, if, you, if it's for you, if it's not for you, that's fine. But it is an interesting world and there's so many little components to it that are very rewarding. So, um, and there's so many different, you don't have to be a jockey, you know, you don't have to be a rider necessarily. Uh, if you just like horses, there's, there's something for you to do. Uh, what I wanted National Racehorse Day or Week to be was, you know, people didn't have to open their yards, but just get, up, get those photographs and those pictures out there of, of the, the brilliant stable staff of Britain looking after their horses and, and treating them better than humans would be treated. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what I really wanted to get across here. Yeah.
Ashley, lovely to see you. Hi, Tom. How nice are you? you? Yeah, good, thank you. Should we look around the yard? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's do it. It's amazing. What is it you think you love most about working with horses? The horses, I feel, they regulate me. So, depending on what kind of mood I'm in, they, they level me out. Mm. Um, and I absolutely love that. Yeah, and I think my favourite thing to do is just watching them, looking at who's boss, you know, who's the henchman that's dragging everybody else around. And I like looking at the dynamic of horses. And I think probably that sort of goes hand in hand with working with the people that I've worked with, you know, and, and helping them. So I think it sort of all sort of ties in together, really. The leader is still clear, and that leader is Dark Shot under Ashley Wichard. Well on top at the moment. Running on to be second, Anna Bonisham on board the speed of white as they head up towards the winning line. It's Ashley Wichard on Dark Shot to win the Magnolia Cup. Let's talk a bit more about you and concentrate on the Magnolia Cup, which mm -hmm. of course was, I imagine, a fantastic day for you. How did it come about that you were able to take part in that? I think I was driving to Ludlow one day and I got a phone call. Uh, from Goodwood saying, would you be interested in, in riding? And I was just like, yeah, 100%. At the end of the phone call, she was like, so is this a definite yes? I was like, yeah, 100%, I'm in. So it was a phone call. I was invited to ride in it, and it's a d the best decision. It was the easiest decision and the best decision I've ever made, really. Well, it certainly turned out well. What was the feeling like when you crossed the line in front? I was still worrying about stopping the horse, to be honest with you, <laughs> to think anything about the race. Or I was thinking, my mouth is dry, I've got to stop this horse, he is like a train. Um, but it was just a real sense of achievement, knowing that all the work that had gone in previous had come to this. I'm a great believer in, like, if it's meant to be, it will be. Trust, trust the process um, and enjoy your experiences. And that's something I definitely did regarding the Magnolia Cup. Yeah, it was jubilant scenes afterwards, and scenes also in which you made headlines by taking the knee as well. And I know that your um, fellow riders that day supported you on that, and how important was that for you? Oh, it was so important. It was so important. The, I didn't want to take away from anybody's experience. At the same time, I needed to show people that look like me that there are going to be changes within the racing industry that's going to make uh, make it easier for them to want to be involved. It, I was I was nervous to say the least because I knew that actually the reaction I get is going to be as a result of how the press cover it. And thankfully, they they I was really happy with the way they it come across in the newspapers and social media. So was it something you'd planned to do for a while? It, it, I had thought about it. I'd um, sort of before Christmas, previous, it was, I was doing a lot of like meditating and positive sort of affirmations and things like that. I still do to a certain degree, but not as much at the moment. <laughs> I need to get back to that. Um, but it, it literally, I, I did this meditation before I went to bed and the next morning I woke up and the vision I had was of me taking the knee in the paddock and I thought, I don't know anybody else that's done that in racing. It's a really good opportunity for me to do it and get plenty of coverage, um, which will then reach, will have a big reach. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. And you obviously thought it was very important in spreading awareness, which of course it did do. Yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's, unfortunately, there's so many people that have not had good experiences in equestrianism as a whole, not necessarily racing. Um, it's, it's still happening now, and it's going to take a long time for things to change, but small steps, it, I believe small steps, but that one sort of big, big moment will, as again, ripple effect. I'm hoping that it will just have an impact. You know, somebody's grandparent might have seen it, and they might turn around and say, oh, to their grandchild or their child, and hopefully it will just go like that. I've no doubt. From a personal point of view, how have you yourself found the openness, inclusivity in racing since you've been involved in it? I haven't really had many issues. I don't feel like I've had any barriers. Maybe that's because of where I grew up and the fact that I've always been in the minority. I've grown up in a predominantly white area um, and so I don't know any different. So maybe I don't recognise them as barriers. But personally, I've had a really good experience. 
have one or two issues, but they fuel my fire. They definitely don't stop me from doing anything I want to do. They just drive me. So thank you to all those people that <laughs> said those comments and things like that. <laughs> Keep going. Spurs you on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, yeah. If you had a racing utopia, a racing ideal world that everyone lived in, say in 20, 30 years time, what would it look like? I would like to see more, I would like to see more themed race days. I think that'd be pretty cool. So uh, I went to one not long ago and there's like a reggae themed race day, which I thought was brilliant. And then all it was was music. And I was like, you're missing the, an opportunity here because so many people love Caribbean food, then don't know how access to it. So like a Caribbean food van or, or, or you know, some jerk chicken on the menu, would have just added to the experience. I just, you know, you could have had a, a Moroccan theme one day. And I'd just like to see more themed stuff because people, I think, really embrace that, especially for experiences and days out. The avid race girl is still going to get the racing. They're still going to get the form and all that sort of stuff. But why don't we make it more of an experience for families and people that aren't really interested in necessarily who wins and who's the best trainer, but just want a good day out with the family. You're quite a wise man, I've decided to myself <laughs> over the last couple of hours. I've conned you. <laughs> In your opinion, the future of racing, what does it look like to you? It's a big question. Um, I think ultimately it will always go on um, because there's too much good in it. And the fact that getting humans working with horses uh, and all the good, and, and again, it's the message to get across, it's not just about, you know, when the horses are rehomed, people, the public want to know what happens to them afterwards. Mm. And a lot of them do brilliant jobs afterwards. I think, you know, and they, they help young people and, and equine therapy is a fascinating thing. Just horse, people working with horses help people. So I think there's so much good in racing, it'll always continue. But I think we've got to, it, the world's changed. We've got to be transparent. We shouldn't be frightened of going on the front foot and saying what we do because we've got nothing to hide. We've got to be proud of it. We've got to be proud of it. And that ultimately racehorses have the life that humans should have. And I think when we first came up with the idea, we thought about having a mirror. I said, do you have private health? Do you have physiotherapy? Do you have 24 hour care? Do you have a balanced diet, an exercise program? How many of us do? I don't. Mm. And, um, oh, do I. and in, in fact, you know, because I'm spending my time looking after horses, I probably put my health behind my horse's health. So I think if we get that message across, the public will like horse racing more. And I think the more we do that, the better racing will be. Given that you didn't have that background in racing from your parents, did you find that opportunities were, were quite hard to come by working with horses or is it fairly straightforward for you? Uh, coming from Bradford on Avon, so I'm already in the country. So, you know, I understand that if I was from the city, I would have different challenges. So that was easier and my mum was a hairdresser so she knew lots of people um, and there were quite a few young people that had ponies that were quite challenging and I didn't so I was quite happy to get on those challenging ponies and do a clear round at a show before they got on um, and just take the rides wherever I could basically. How long was it before you decided this is what I want to do for a career, work with horses, work with people in racing? Career-wise it was probably just after I had my daughter because it fit around school hours um, and it was something I enjoyed doing, didn't really feel like work. Um, it got me outside and yeah, it, like I said, it was, I, I worked for Chloe Roddick so I would go there in the morning um, and then it, I was able to come back up during our lunch break sort of thing, pick Phoenix up, my daughter, and then sometimes bring her back to the yard where she would then put the dogs that normally roam around the yard on a lead. <laughs> and take them for a walk while I was, you know, carrying on brushing the horses and mucking up the stables. Yeah, it's an interesting way of life, isn't it? It's not a way of life that would appeal to everyone, but clearly it suited you at the time. Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, as I said, I just, it, it was a, 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 a lifestyle that I really enjoyed. To me, it felt natural. Um, so the only thing that was a challenge for me was my skin. I had really bad eczema and it, it got to a point where I had to take a step back from racing completely. So when you had those 
eczema issues, what were you doing work-wise during that period? Uh, I went to work in a few schools. I went to work um, for the Priory uh, in Froome, working with kids with autism and Asperger's. I enjoyed it, um, but it wasn't it wasn't quite what I wanted to do. But the, when I was there, there was um, a guy with autism that did a, like a conference, and he said that if you work with horses, you would have a really good skill set for working with children with autism because you've got the fight, flight, freeze reactions exactly the same, and the, the children won't necessarily tell you what's wrong. You have to work it out for yourself. So. I was able to transfer those skills, but as I said, it wasn't quite what I wanted to do. And then I come across a job that was working with kids that are more at risk of being targeted for county lines, so kids from the city. Mm -hmm. um, it was a residential school near Chippenham. Um, I started working there, and that was a brand new experience because the kids were bigger, they were a bit more they were not as like severely autistic as some of the children that I'd encountered before. Um, they were more sort of streetwise. Do you think helping those kids by introducing them to horses would be beneficial to them and, and getting them out and about and seeing what racing can be like? Because it can help people who are you know, perhaps more in need than others. Yeah, so once I, once I left that role, I worked for a charity called Key for Life and they used music, horses and sport to engage the guys uh, 18 to 30, they're at risk of going to prison, they've been in prison, we've done prison programmes. So I've seen firsthand how the horses help children, adults, and I genuinely think that the, the demographic of people that work in racing are practical people, they're in tune with the animals. Working in racing, you don't have to be academic, which is a great thing about it. And I think that a lot of the stable yard roles really benefit people that manage outdoors and not in the classroom environment. And I think those people we should actually be trying to grab hold of before they go down a route that might not ne necessarily suit the community. If they're given a purpose and a sense of being um, and a sense of belonging, they'll be less likely to go on the county, ra uh, the county lines route do you think racing should be doing more to help those kind of I think racing should be doing a lot more, I, but that's the exciting thing about it is that we can be a part of that. If we can start digging out the story, and we wouldn't have to look very far for all the positive stories and all the positive ways that racing is helping people, um, and then it's not just helping people, that has a knock-on effect to families. Do you think that is the main problem with the current naysayers? That education is key, that they aren't educated in, in, in how wonderful it is to be around these horses. Ultimately, everyone in racing has the horse as the main focal point and that's why they're in it. And that's why I think National Racehorse Week works, because you can't argue with it. You're celebrating the racehorse. There's only one reason we're doing it. We're doing it for the racehorse. I think your yard here is a perfect example of that. Every horse seems to be very happy, enjoying themselves, and so do the staff as well. Yeah, and I think that, again, you can't fake that. So that's why I want people to come into yards. I mean, we've had 300 visitors. I'm amazed at how many visitors we had the last two years for National Racers Week. And they've been queuing up at nine o'clock coming in. But immediately the horses just go to the people. And the people are sort of quite amazed that, you know, that all oh, race horses do that. Yeah, because humans are good to them. They like humans because they're looking for their guidance. Rather like me and my school teachers. I'm looking for, <laughs> you know, I'm looking for that um, interest, as it were. And so I think it's, it's a big part of it that, so you can tell them all day long, but once they witness it, especially the young people, because you can tell this, is, this game is cruel or this game is the greatest in the world. You can tell them everything you like, but what they will feel is the most important thing. And as soon as they walk in into a yard, most yards, they'll think, well, actually, that's a happy horse. And I think as long as we do that, um, we'll be a better industry yeah, and sport. That's it for the latest edition of this Racing Live. Thanks very much indeed to the trainers who have opened their doors to us and indeed to Ashley Witchard as well. Join us again next time for the next edition of this Racing Live. Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.